Okay, good evening everyone. It's seven o'clock and it's time for a birthday party. Um, so today we're celebrating two fairly momentous occasions, I would say. Uh, the first is, of course, the 30th birthday of Hubble, the space telescope that was launched in 1990, um, 30 years ago. So that's actually tomorrow is its actual birthday, April 24th. Um, but today is my birthday as well, which as I say is kind of equally important. Uh, I don't think everyone would agree with that, but I certainly feel that way. Um, so I wanted to celebrate this joint birthday with a public talk. Uh, it gives me a nice way to interact with all you lovely people on the internet uh, on my birthday. Uh, so yeah, so that's what we're going to be doing today, is just a little bit of a, a chat on Hubble. So uh, it's a really big, I think essentially what I wanted to do in this talk is celebrate a little bit of the journey that Hubble went through in order to become a space telescope mission in the first place. And then also all the wonderful science that's enabled over 30 years, so three decades worth of stuff. Um, and even though it's been up in space now for 30 years, Hubble's still probably the, the most sought after telescope for astronomers to use. Uh, it's beautiful, you know, image quality and the wealth of science it's permitted is just incredible, really. Uh, and this image here just shows, you know, a few, a few highlights of some of the stuff it's looked at, you know, and it's, it's given us more information on everything from planets within our solar system to far flung uh, star clusters, uh, like nebulae, nebulae, and also, you know, galaxies that we can find all the way back to essentially almost the beginning of the universe. So it's an incredible piece of machinery, really, an incredible piece of kit. Um, and so I just wanted to talk a little bit about some of the, some of the, some of my personal highlights, I think, from things I've really enjoyed, results I've really liked coming out of Hubble, uh, and pictures that I just think are really nice as well. Uh, so that's essentially what we're going to do today. And I'd first like to say thanks as well to Hubble, because uh, as part of its 30th birthday celebrations, there's a website you can go to at the moment where you can enter your birthday and you can get, you can see essentially what Hubble has uh, imaged on your birthday. And my birthday image from Hubble is very nice. This is what it took it back in 2008. And this is actually an image of the centre of our galaxy. So it's taken in the infrared, uh, so it can pierce through all the dust and gas that gets in the way as we're trying to look towards the centre of the galaxy. And it shows us about this sort of huge, massive star formation that we're having right in the middle of our galaxy, close to the central supermassive black hole. Um, and so all that you're seeing here is, you know, high mass star formation, uh, very energetic hot gas and dust and things like that. So this is Hubble's birthday gift to me. Um, it's really only had one gift to me, apparently, since 2008, but that's, that's fine, whatever. It's still nice. Um, and it's quite an impressive image. Um, but yeah, so, but back to more a little bit about Hubble. Um, now, as usual in the talk today, we are going to be using uh, the Slido app, um, so I'll just sort of uh, explain how we're going to do that. So, um, uh, in order to, for you guys to interact, so you can ask questions as I'm doing the talk, and also participate in polls as we're going through the talk, uh, if you just go to slido.com uh, on your internet-enabled device, you can join in with the event using the hashtag Hubble30. And that will let you ask questions, uh, and I'm doing moderated questions, um, uh, so that I can see what you've said before you enter it. Just because you know, I was talking to some of my colleagues today, and they were talking about um, heckling. So you know, I've got to keep an eye on what's what's coming up in the Q and A. Um, but as I see the different questions, we can get sort of them coming through, uh, uh, and I'll ask uh, a lot of I'll answer and answer all these questions at the end. Um, but before we do that. Uh, I thought I'd ask you to do a quick poll uh, at the beginning. So Hubble uh, was launched in 1990, but as with all space missions, typically you find that, you know, from planning your space telescope to actually launching it and seeing it do its great work um, takes a long time. It can be, you know, sort of your career to, to, to launch a space telescope, really. Um, so if it was launched in 1990, uh, what, roughly when do you think the idea for Hubble was first conceived? So if we can trace back through history, when did someone first um, suggest that we should make a telescope like Hubble that should be launched uh, finally in 1990? Do you think it was in 1969? So, you know, right around the time of the space race and the moon landings, maybe 1958 when the space race really kicked off, uh, perhaps 1934 or maybe 1946, so right around sort of buffering World War II there. Uh, so we have a couple of votes so far, sort of like, uh, favouring the 50s or 60s. I'll just give you a little bit of time uh, to vote for these different these different times. Uh, 
Okay, so we're doing pretty good here. So it seems like people are converging maybe towards the 50s and 60s at the moment. I'll just give you a little bit more time to vote and then we'll move on. So yeah, so I think it seems like most people think probably around the time of the space race, and that makes sense, right? That's when we began to see things being launched into orbit um, uh, in terms of satellites and everything else, but that's actually not the correct answer. So uh, I'll just go back to the presentation. So it's been 30 years of exploration, exploration, but actually it was a very long road from the sort of the concept of the Hubble Space Telescope uh, up until the launch. So the first person to that we can sort of tie back the idea of Hubble to is Lyman Spitzer in 1946. And he wrote a report on the benefits and the advantages of having a space-based observatory. Um, and this is just a quote from his report here. Uh, so he said that, you know, while a more exhaustive analysis would alter some of the details in his study in 1946, it wouldn't change the primary conclusions, which is that a scientific tool, if practically feasible, could revolutionise astronomical techniques and open up completely new vistas of astronomical research. And he was very right about that. So his idea was that if you could take a telescope and remove it from, you know, sort of the confines of our own atmosphere, you could just change the way that you do imaging and make much more precise images and also image parts of the electromagnetic spectrum that we can't really do from the ground. So the two main benefits he saw of a space telescope would be that firstly, um, you could get a much better resolution or precision in your image. So when light passes through our atmosphere, it gets scattered um, by all the sort of, you know, the elements, all the atoms and gas in our atmosphere, so oxygen, nitrogen, etc. That will scatter the light that's coming to us from distant stars, distant planets, distant galaxies, uh, and smear out essentially what you're seeing. Uh, and so in that way, your resolution becomes sort of dominated by what's the, like, the limiting factor becomes the atmosphere. Now, if you can take a telescope and place it outside the atmosphere, then your resolution is no longer limited by the atmosphere, but limited by the precision to which you can make your camera accurate. And that's much better, actually. So he foresaw that you could have a sort of a factor of 10 improvement on the resolution of your images by going into space. And in addition to that, you could also image objects not only in the optical part of the spectrum, but also move into the ultraviolet and the infrared. And ultraviolet and infrared radiation is typically very well absorbed by our atmosphere. So again, this is very difficult to do from the ground. So this is how he saw a space telescope revolutionising uh, what we did. But of course, at this point, we didn't actually, we weren't successfully launching things into space. Um, we didn't have a, like, a national space programmes in general. Um, so this was sort of an initial report, but it took a, a while for the technology uh, to sort of catch up and to really allow... Uh, a space program that could deliver something like the large space telescope that Lyman Spitzer proposed back in the 40s. Um, so things started to get uh, more intense around space telescopes and space missions in general in 1958. Uh, and this is when, uh, well actually really it was 1957. So in 1957, Russia launched the first artificial satellite to orbit around the Earth, Sputnik. Um, and in response to that, the Americans uh, decided that they needed to also build up their own space program to sort of catch up with and hopefully beat the Russians in the race for space. So in 1958, they formed NASA uh, in its first form, so the National Aeronautics and Space Administration, uh, with the goal of, uh, you know, getting satellites and eventually people, of course, as well, into orbit around the Earth and even further afield. So it was 1958 that it was formed. And in terms of Hubble journey, Hubble's journey, the next important date is probably not much longer after NASA was formed in 1959, um, when they got Nancy Roman, uh, was made chief of NASA's astronomy and relativity programs. So Nancy Roman uh, was an astronomer back in the 50s. And she was actually at a, a scientific meeting where someone asked her if uh, she knew of anyone that would be interested in essentially running NASA's uh, space astronomy program. Now, she saw that as an invitation to uh, apply, so she didn't recommend anyone apply for the job, and she got the job, so I think that's really like amazing that she did that. Uh, and she was incredibly good at her job, and so she really pushed forward the sort of the concept of a space astronomy program. She formed committees and working groups in order to sort of design the concepts for what like a space mission would look like, what a large space telescope would look like, and then she then pushed uh, for the technology to be developed, pushed for the funding to be given, 
And it was really her work that allowed the Hubble programme to sort of move forward. She orchestrated it all. Uh, and for that reason, she's often referred to as the mother of Hubble. Now, uh, that was all very well and good, but we did need some new technology to really make a space mission worthwhile. And in particular, we needed uh, new imaging technology in the form of CCDs or charge coupled devices. So these are essentially pixels, right, which can turn uh, a signal from light hitting a detector into an electronic signal that can then be passed into a computer. And you needed this for imaging in space because if you were just using old forms of imaging, say photographic film or photographic plates, you have no way of changing your film or your plates if you have a telescope up in the atmosphere or up above the atmosphere. Uh, so you need something that can take an image, record it digitally, and then send the information back down to Earth. And so CCDs is what was needed in order to make a space telescope really viable. And it was in about the 1970s that CCDs became widely, more widely available or certainly uh, more efficient such that you could envision having a space telescope with a camera made up of CCD pixels. So this is really kind of the thing that then really allowed the project to get going. So all the way from 46, when the first, the first concept came up, uh, we then needed until the 70s to get technology around about on the right page to make something like the Hubble Space Telescope. Now then, in... Um, 1977, um, with this like advance in the technologies uh, and pushing for funding from Congress, eventually Congress did approve a budget for a space telescope. Um, and in 1983, uh, what was formerly known as the Large Space Telescope as a concept uh, was then renamed to the Hubble Space Telescope. And originally it was supposed to be launched uh, in 1983, but there were a number of setbacks, uh, as is quite common with some space telescopes. So there was a delay to launching. So 1983 was the a first goal, uh, but there, at this point, the mirror, largely it was the mirror for Hubble that was, la was quite delayed. Uh, so they couldn't launch on the planned date. Uh, they had to push back for a number of years in order to get that mirror designed and all everything in place to actually launch Hubble. Um, but eventually it was launched. Um, so as I said, originally they planned to launch it in 1983, but a number of technical delays meant that it had to be set back to 1986. But then in 1986, it suffered another setback, and that was because of the Challenger disaster. So in 1986, um, shortly after launch, the Challenger space shuttle disintegrated. Uh, so it was a big tragedy in terms of space travel. Uh, unfortunately, all the crew uh, were killed. Um, and there were seven people on the shuttle. And so after that, the space shuttle program, which is what would be needed to take Hubble into orbit, was shut down for a number of years uh, until they could be sure that it was you know, safe, uh, or as safe as it can be, to send people back into space again. Uh, but eventually, uh, it was decided people could go to space again, uh, and so they rescheduled the launch of Hubble for April in 1990. And the final launch day ended up being the 24th of April, um, which was very exciting, and that is, of course, its anniversary then tomorrow. Now, um, this is the Hubble Space Telescope. It's a picture taken of it from a shuttle from above. So we can see it drifting there over the Pacific Ocean. Um, and it's had this long journey to actually being completed and sent into space. And it wasn't without its challenges. We've talked a little bit about the delays that it suffered. Um, and this is gonna lead me to my next question. So originally, uh, back in 1977, the pro proposed or projected cost for the Space Telescope was about $400 million to build it, launch it, and getting up, get it up into space. Now, given the number of delays and the other issues that were faced in designing and building the telescope, that cost ended up not being the final cost. So it was underestimated by quite a bit. Uh, but how much do you think, given that the initial projected cost of Hubble was 400 million, how much do you think it eventually went on to cost? So again, you can join in with this poll by going to slido.com um, using the hashtag Hubble30. And your options are 800 million, 2.4 billion, 4.7 billion and 10.9 billion dollars. So, you know, it wasn't a cheap mission. It is a very tiny proportion of the US's uh, annual budget, though. I'd like to point that out as well. So these numbers sound incredibly large, but in terms of sending a very complex piece of machinery into space, it's actually a very good deal, um, even though it ended up costing more than it was supposed to. Uh, so we have two votes so far going straight for the billions. So no one thinks it costs 800 million. You're all like thinking it's the big bucks. OK, 
because I'm just looking through some of your questions as you're answering this, so I'll just give you a little bit more time. All right, so it seems like we're settling on a number here of about 4.7 billion. Uh, so that would be about 10 times the initial projected cost of Hubble. Um, and that is actually correct. Um, so in the end, uh, by the launch date, Hubble ended up costing $4.7 billion to, to design, to build and to launch. So that's quite a large difference. Um, and this is a problem that space telescopes are not unknown to run into. Uh, and especially when you're designing something completely new, like Hubble was the first of its kind. Um, the technology just turns out to be more complicated than you thought. So the mirror took a lot longer to design and build than they thought it would. You had all these multiple delays, which end up, you know, piling costs on year upon year for each year that you're delayed. And so it ended up costing quite a bit more than the initial price tag of $400 million. But I think all astronomers would agree, worth every cent. Now, in terms of the specifications of Hubble, uh, its famous mirror is about 2.4 meters in diameter. Um, so, you know, larger than the, quite significantly larger than the average person, maybe even larger than David Corey, I think, um, in terms of its diameter. That's a Guilford running joke there. Uh, and initially it was built with to, have to carry five instruments. And the cool thing about these instruments were um, they could be changed over time. So one of the nice things about the Hubble Space Telescope was it was put into an orbit um, about uh, 540 kilometers, well, initially about 600 kilometers over our heads, where it could still be accessed by the space shuttle. So we could send astronauts to go and fix it, to give it upgrades, uh, and to take care of it while it's orbiting around the Earth. Uh, and that's something that we don't, we don't have the capability for anymore now that we don't have the shuttle program. Back when Hubble was launched, this was still possible. So I had five initial instruments, uh, a number of cameras and spectrographs to study um, the universe at different wavelengths and in different ways. And its main camera, uh, one of the most used ones, was the Wide Field Camera, the Wide Field Planetary Camera. And if we compare it to the technology we have now, so it was a state-of-the-art camera, obviously, when Hubble was uh, designed and launched, uh, and it had 0.64 megapixels in the camera. Now, if you compare that to your smartphone today, typically they have something like 12, 10 to 12 megapixels in their camera. Um, and the number of megapixels essentially defines how well, how high your resolution is of an image. So um, this now looks like a very dated number, right? 0.64 is about 20 times uh, lower resolution than the average smartphone these days. Uh, but it's still capable of taking, this camera was still capable of taking incredible images of space, and I'll show some of them to you in this talk. Okay, so this is an image from uh, that first, when Hubble was first launched and delivered into space. So this is it being released from the cargo bay of the Discovery Shuttle. Um, uh, and so essentially what they did was they took it up into this low Earth orbit, uh, and then they uh, worked on it for a few days uh, in order to get it out into space and spaceworthy. I think there was something like five spacewalks that needed to be done uh, in order to, to get everything up and running. And so you can see here, there's a little gold bar on the left there. That's actually the solar sails of Hubble, uh, where it can get generate its power from. So they had to unfurl uh, once it got into space. And this is just an image of them unfurling there. Um, and finally, at the end of the mission, Hubble could be released from the shuttle and then placed into its orbit so that it could orbit above the Earth at roughly 600 kilometers. Now, over time, Hubble's orbit gets lower and lower, which is why it's about 540 kilometers above us now. And that's because there is still some atmospheric drag on it, even at that high height. And so over time, it gets pulled out of its orbit into lower and lower orbits. And in the end, this sets its, its final possible lifetime. So Hubble's currently been going for about 30 years, well, for almost exactly 30 years, as of tomorrow. Uh, and in total, uh, if we can't service the telescope anymore and nothing breaks, we think it can last up to about 2040 at the latest before it re-enters the atmosphere uh, and breaks up. So we think we have another possibly 10 or 20 years lifetime on Hubble if all of its instruments stay working uh, and before it would then fall into the atmosphere. So potentially that's a 50 year, um, a 50 year telescope mission, which is really, really impressive. If we get back out on service, it could be prolonged even longer. Uh, but without um, missions that can take a crew into space, it's not clear that we'll be able to do that. So once it was up there, uh, it took some of its first images, and this is all very exciting because one of the key things about Hubble was that it was going to have this incredible imaging capability compared to what we could get from the ground. So, um, you know, you'd have this much higher image resolution, you wouldn't have any interference from the atmosphere, 
And so it should have a huge uh, increase in our terms of the precision of our, of our images of space. So on the left-hand side of this image here, um, we're looking at something that an image that's been taken of, of, from the ground of a number of stars. And on the right, we're looking at one of the calibration images, so taken for focusing Hubble um, on the Hubble Space Telescope. And you can sort of see the effect here of having no atmosphere. Um, so if we look at that top blob on the left-hand picture, it's like a sort of extended blob. And then we look at it on the right at the top, it's sort of resolving into two separate objects. Like, and that's actually because it's a binary star. And with Hubble's precision, you could start to resolve these as two separate stars, whereas on the ground, you would only be able to see them as sort of one big blob. So we're already seeing like this huge impact that Hubble's having. However, this wasn't as good as they were expecting. So in this particular image, it's about 50% better than what is observed from the ground. But the numbers that were being thrown around in some of the predictions for how well Hubble would do was sort of a 10 times, you know, 10 times better, potentially up to 10 times better. Um, so this was something of a surprise. Uh, and it turns out that this is because Hubble's mirror uh, was not actually correct. So the mirror itself has to be designed to be a very specific shape. Uh, and over many years, a company worked on this to sort of mill it and grind it down to the perfect shape such that when light hits the mirror, it bounces off in the correct direction uh, and then falls into the eyepiece, or not the eyepiece, but into the instrument path so that the cameras and everything else can focus it and take exquisite images. Now, any change in the shape of the mirror that's not planned for means that the light won't be bouncing in the correct direction and you'll essentially get interference uh, in your signal. And this seemed to be what was happening with Hubble. So this is a picture um, taken of a star, and if Hubble was working well, you should just see a little round point in the middle there, and not this sort of weird diffraction spiky halo around it. And that diffraction halo there is essentially from all of this light interference because the, the Hubble mirror was not milled correctly. The problem was essentially that uh, it's supposed to be curved, and in the outskirts it wasn't curved enough, so the edges were too flat, and that meant the light wasn't behaving in the correct way, so it was unable to be focused properly. And this is a really big problem actually for Hubble um, because many of its key science goals require exquisite imaging. Um, so one thing they wanted to do with Hubble is to measure the expansion of the universe and therefore the age of the universe. And to do that you have to focus um, you know, very faint light from very distant objects uh, in order to make those very precise measurements. But with something like this, you aren't going to be able to do that. You can take pictures of some bright things and, you know, you can do some quite nice imaging, but all of its big cosmological goals, or its key missions, were not going to be possible with this kind of problem with the mirror. So it was a huge deal uh, and, you know, had a lot of people quite worried because you've made this $4.7 billion telescope and it is not performing um, as desired. So there was quite some concern. However, our buddy Lyman Spitzer, who came up with the idea of a space telescope in the first place, was less concerned. Uh, and he's uh, known to say that these things take time and we'll just have to fix it. And again, this is one of the good things about Hubble being in a near, a low Earth orbit that's accessible to space shuttles. It was planned that there would be a servicing mission not long after the Hubble launch. And so the plan was to figure out how to fix this issue with Hubble's mirror and then have this um, servicing mission go there and just basically fix it so that it could do all the things that we planned for it to do just a couple years later than planned. And in the meantime, it could still take some quite nice pictures. So this is one of the early images it took of Jupiter. Um, and it's not as sharp as some of the images they're used to seeing of Jupiter now, but at the time it was like still very impressive. So you can see an incredible amount of detail, even with the poor focusing of the atmosphere of Jupiter. You can see all these swirly clouds. You can see the great red spot. Um, so that's what, you know, can look at Jupiter. And then it could also take images like this. And so this is actually of the Cygnus loop, I think, uh, which is uh, this sort of big gas plumes and ejections and shells that have been formed by a supernova explosion that's sort of heating up gas and shocking it, making it into these really beautiful bright colours um, as it heats the gas around the star that's exploded um, and sort of died. Um, so that's really nice as well. So then, you know, it still could do some pretty nice imaging, just not quite all you we were hoping for in the very early days. Um, and in order to correct this, we do what we do with many people that have poor eyesight, uh, and they decided they had to attach some spectacles to Hubble. So they used, made this, essentially designed this complicated set of spectacles that they called CoStar, uh, and this had to be delivered to the Space Telescope um, by astronauts in the Space Shuttle, and then it could be attached onto, essentially into the light path uh, of the Hubble Space Telescope, 
to correct the way that life was being bent towards the focal points of the instruments. And by putting this in place, essentially you're just correcting for the fact that the mirror is not quite the shape that you designed it to be. Uh, so it's like adding in some extra lenses, which is why it's kind of akin to having um, a pair of spectacles. And so once this was installed, it meant the Hubble should be up to its full capabilities and able to do all the key science that it was planned to do. Uh, and so this mission was launched in 1993, the servicing mission right at the end of 1993. Uh, and the improvements were huge. And you can see that just by some images they took of uh, M100 before and after delivering this fix. So on the left here, this is a picture that Hubble took of the M100 spiral galaxy um, in 1993, shortly before um, this correction was applied. And you can make out the spiral arms there. You can even see some of the star clusters, these sort of big bright spots there in the arms of the spiral galaxy where new stars are forming. Uh, and you can see some detail in the color as well. So the central part is redder, the outskirts are more blue. Um, so there's some information there. But once the um, co-star uh, correction was applied, suddenly this image became much sharper and we could see the detail much more beautifully of this sort of the different patterns in the spiral galaxy's arms. So now not only can you see those star clusters, you can sort of see that some of the ones that look like just giant clusters are actually a, a number of smaller ones, so they're better resolved. And we can begin to see all this beautiful details of dust lanes, so these sort of orangey brown streaks and um, feathering patterns throughout the spiral arms. Uh, these are lanes of dust that are essentially obscuring some of the light from the galaxy itself. And all that information, that detail is now possible now that this correction has been applied. Um, and this is also taken with a new camera that they installed at the same time, the uh, upgrade to the wide field planetary camera. And since then it's had another upgrade to this camera as well, uh, and we can get even sharper images now of that M100 galaxy. So over time Hubble just gets better and better. It ages very well, just like me. So in terms of Hubble's main goals, now that it's fixed it could start um, really addressing some key projects. Now the main one, as I said before, was measuring the expansion of the universe which involves a precision measurement of the Hubble constant, which I'll talk more about in, in just a moment. It also wanted to study what was between galaxies and what we call the intergalactic medium. So often in astronomy we focus on taking images of these beautiful, brilliant galaxies, and we can see what's all inside them. But there's also stuff between the galaxies, so like intervening gas, for example. Uh, and we think, in fact, a lot of the gas in the universe is not within galaxies, but without them. Uh, and so Hubble was aiming to study that content by um, seeing it's the, the, the sort of the absorption of that material as, you know, bright lights behind them. So very bright galaxies pierce through that me medium. And then you'll be able to see the effect of that intervening gas on the starlight from that very distant galaxy. So that was another key project. And it also wants just to do some very deep surveys of galaxies. And to do that, it just wants to, you know, the deeper your image is, the further back in time you can see, so the more distant galaxies you can see. And you can learn more about what the universe looked like at a very early age. So those were the key goals for Hubble. And now that it was working properly, they could be achieved. So, you know, it is called the Hubble Space Telescope and that's because one of its key goals was to measure what is known as the Hubble constant. Uh, and the Hubble constant is actually a misleading name because it changes with time, um, but it is constant at the present time, I guess. So it's known as the Hubble constant uh, for various reasons. Uh, but it all has to do with the, the expansion of the universe. So back in the 1920s, Edwin Hubble, who's this chap on the left here with the pipe, um, was studying uh, how galaxies moved as a function of distance. So you can measure how fast a galaxy is moving, and then you can compare it to how far away it is. Um, and if the universe is just kind of randomly oriented, you wouldn't expect to see any trend there. But as we can see in this figure in the bottom right, uh, if you compare the distance on the x-axis to the speed with which a galaxy is moving on the y-axis, you can see the further away your object is, the faster it appears to be moving with respect to the Earth or to our galaxy. And so it has this almost linear relationship, or a linear relationship between the distance and the speed of a galaxy. And what that tells us is actually that the, gal the universe as a whole is expanding with time. And we can link this all back to the Big Bang that began our universe, when the universe was much smaller and denser before violently exploding into the universe as we know it today. So because of that explosion, we're still all moving away uh, from from one another as the universe expands and expands with time. And what that means is the further away an object is from you, the faster it appears to be moving uh, relatively to you. Uh, and he really showed that uh, building on the work of a lot of other people, uh, including this woman here on the bottom right. This is uh, Henrietta Swan-Leavitt, 
It was thanks to some of her um, excellent distant measurements of Cepheid variable stars, which are stars that essentially change their luminosity or their brightness with time. So they kind of pulsate, getting brighter and dimmer. And she realised that there was a relationship between how quickly they change brightness to how bright they are intrinsically. And so if you can measure how fast they are changing their brightness, you can work out how bright they must be and therefore how far away they have to be. So it's a really strong distance indicator that we call a standard candle. And using those kind of distance indicators, Hubble could figure out how far away the galaxies he was studying were in order to make this diagram here and figure out this linear relationship. So therefore, if you know how fast a galaxy is moving, which is relatively easy to measure, you can figure out how far away it is if you just multiply or use this sort of this Hubble constant here uh, in order to infer its distance. So uh, H0 is the key parameter then for understanding uh, or relating the speed of a galaxy to how far away it is from you. And um, this was quite difficult to measure. And so before the Hubble Space Telescope came along, there was a huge debate about whether this value was 50 or 100 kilometers per second per megaparsec. And there were two very strong camps, neither of whom would agree with each other. And so Hubble was aiming to study essentially these variable stars that Henrietta swan Leavitt uh, discovered the relationship for in various different galaxies. So I've got some here from the M81 galaxy on the left and then one in the Andromeda galaxy on the right here. Um, and by studying these very precisely with the Hubble Space Telescope, they could really measure precise distances to a large number of objects. And by doing that, they could make a much more impressive version of Hubble's initial plot in order to infer what this H0 or Hubble constant value is. So this is the, the key plot from that work. And uh, so here again, you have distance on the x-axis and on the y-axis in the top plot is velocity, so the speed. And again, you can see this nice linear relationship for various different objects that relates their velocity and their distance together. And from figuring out the gradient of that, you can then work out what the Hubble constant needs to be. And what they found was a value of 72 kilometers per second per megaparsec, funnily enough, directly between the two opposing camps. Um, so these very strong opinions that were had about 50 and 100 turned out to both be equally wrong. Uh, and the value is now around about 70 kilometers per second per megaparsec. Interestingly, we still disagree, actually, there's new camps now about what the Hubble value should be, but that's the source of a whole other talk. But suffice it to say, um, it still causes us problems even to this day as to why the Hubble value is not always measured to be the same number, depending on the method you use. Uh, and this just shows you how it improved with time. So back in Hubble's day, they thought it was more like 600 kilometers per second per megaparsec. They were very off with that, but you know, that was the 1920s, so it doesn't make, it doesn't make sense. Uh, and then over time, it's just got more and more precise. Um, so now we know this value very well. But as I said, it disagrees depending on exactly how you measure it. Uh, but the disagreement is smaller uh, than it was before. So another big key, prob um, key goal of Hubble was to really look further and further away from the Milky Way, so further and further back in time, in order to learn about what different galaxies look like at different epochs. And so back in the 1990s, before Hubble was launched, uh, if you were just using ground-based telescopes, you could only peer back so far into sort of the history of the universe. And how far back you could go was maybe sort of, you know, a few billion years after the Big Bang. Um, and we really wanted to be able to see much, much further away, and so much further back in time, so closer to the Big Bang, which happened about 13.7 billion years ago. So once Hubble was up and running at its full strength, uh, it took on a quite risky project where essentially um, it took deep images of what appeared to be completely empty sky. Uh, and astronomers didn't know what would come out of that in the end because the Hubble field of view is actually quite small. If you compare it to the moon, um, the size of the Hubble field of view on the sky is about one tenth the diameter of the, of the moon, which is about one over 65 thousandth of the total sky area or something like that. It's a very small part of the sky. Um, and they decided they wanted to spend about 100 hours just looking at a piece of sky that looked very empty. Um, and that's a long time to spend of Hubble's looking at the same patch of sky without knowing what you're going to find in the end. So it was quite the gamble. Um, but they found out that it's worked quite well, so well that they repeated this several more times using the Hubble Ultra Deep Field and the Hubble Ultra Deep Field in the infrared to push further and further back um, into cosmic history. So with the first Ultra Deep Field in 1990, well, the Deep Field in 1995, where they took 100 hours of data, this is what the final image looked like um, from that survey. And there was something like about 3,000 galaxies in this image alone. 
Um, so that was very impressive. Uh, so they decided to repeat this with a new camera uh, on the Hubble Space Telescope in 2004. But this time they decided to observe for more like 11.3 days, which is about 270 hours of Hubble time. And uh, this, just, this just gave a wealth of information about galaxies going back, you know, sort of over 10 billion years. And there's about 10,000 galaxies in this image here. And then to enhance this, this is taken in the optical, so sort of the visible wavelength uh, part of the electromagnetic spectrum. But to improve upon this, you can also move into the infrared. And the infrared is interesting because light from distant galaxies is shifted into the red because they're all receding from us. So because of this expansion of space between us and those distant galaxies, the light becomes redder. So light that would be blue when it was emitted from a distant galaxy becomes more red uh, as it travels to us. So if you move into the infrared, you can start to see more of the galaxies because that's where they're emitting most of their light as we see it now, as we can capture it now. So by combining with the... Um, the, uh, this infrared uh, deep field as well, we could really push very, very far back in time in order to image some of the earliest galaxies that are thought to have formed. And in fact, the earliest galaxy we can see at the moment is something called uh, GNZ11, I believe. Uh, and it was found by Pascal Osh from Hubble uh, Imaging. And it's this little red blob here. And so this galaxy is already relatively massive, only a few hundred million years after the Big Bang. Uh, and that's really impressive because it means galaxy assembly must happen really, really rapidly, more rapidly perhaps than we might have thought. Um, and Hubble has really allowed us to make these kind of measurements of the earliest times in the universe, more than 13 billion years ago. It's taken more than 13 billion years for the light from this galaxy to reach us. And now we can study this galaxy and try and figure out what it means for how you know the whole universe formed. And this is all from a, a slight gamble with the Hubble Space Telescope, where they just pointed it at an empty patch of sky which I think is really cool. Um, and this is why blue sky science is fun because you have a crazy idea and you implement it and you can get incredible results. Okay, so that's Hubble's deepest pictures, but I wanna talk a little bit about Hubble's biggest picture. So the, the biggest image that it's ever been constructed from uh, a single Hubble program. And it's part of my favorite galaxy actually. So this is the Andromeda galaxy. Uh, and back in roughly, I think 2010, uh, Julianne Dalcanton, proposed to image a huge swathe of Hubble, uh, of Andromeda with Hubble. And that was quite um, gutsy, uh, because in the end, in order to cover uh, Andromeda on the sky with a Hubble pointing, you need loads and loads and loads of Hubble pointing, so Hubble fields, uh, because it's so big on the sky. If you compare the disk of Andromeda to the size of the moon, uh, it's more like they're quite comparable in size. Um, whereas, you know, I think the Andromeda disk is about three times the size of the moon on the sky. And the Hubble field of view, as we talked about with the deep field, is only one-tenth the size of the moon's diameter. So you need a lot of um, Hubble fields, Hubble pictures, to make up, you know, a significant chunk of the Andromeda galaxy. But Julianne proposed to do this, uh, and in the end, it required observing 411 different fields in this galaxy for more than 390 hours of time on the Space Telescope to make up this huge patch of the galaxy here, which you can see as this kind of outline. Uh, and it was a really incredible program, and it allows you to see hundreds of millions of stars. So if we just zoom in now, this is the end image here. Uh, and there's 100, more than 100 million stars in this picture alone. And we can see them forming, you know, ones that are very old, that have been uh, orbiting around this galaxy for a long time, but also some that are forming now in brand new star clusters that are really young and just recently formed all through the Andromeda disk. So it was a huge program, and it's led to lots of interesting results uh, on our nearest neighbor galaxy. Um, and again, yeah, it's a very ambitious program um, to take, you know, this amount of Hubble time to just look, to look at one galaxy. Uh, and I think that's really impressive as well. So those are the deepest and the biggest pictures, but Hubble's taken lots of amazing pictures in general. So I'm just going to sort of finish my talk with a bit of a whirlwind um, tour through some of my favourite Hubble pictures. And at the end, I'm going to have you vote on which one you think is your favourite. Uh, and there's no right answer to that question. I'm just intrigued to see what you like out of the selection that I present. So that's what we're going to do now. So the first one is arguably one of the most famous images from Hubble. Uh, this is a picture of the Eagle Nebula. And this is also referred to as the Pillars of Creation. So this is a nebula that's about 6,500 light years away from us. And the pillars are essentially stellar nurseries. So in these big columns, you're forming new stars all the time. And then the hot radiation from those stars, both in and around uh, these dust clouds, are essentially heating up that dust and slowly evaporating and shaping these columns that you see. And depending on how quickly that's happening, 
it's possible that this image we're seeing now, uh, this nebula may not look like this at all anymore. Uh, so there's two schools of thought here about how the pillars of creation might actually look today, because it's taken 6,500 years for the light to reach us. And some people think they could have been completely destroyed now by all this hot radiation that's burning away these dust pillars. But some other people think they'll actually last for much longer. But it's cool to think that this thing we're seeing now is already so far in the past that it may not even exist anymore, but we're still able to see it with the Hubble Space Telescope. Uh, also, it's really pretty, so there's that too. Uh, and next one is uh, of my favourite planet. Uh, this is Saturn, of course, I'm sure you're all familiar. But this is Saturn as taken in the UV, which is why it's kind of got this disco look. Um, so it's a false colour image showing us what, how sort of um, Saturn is, is radiating or, you know, behaving in the ultraviolet wavelengths. Uh, and I think it's very pretty. And it's actually taken at a point where Saturn is showing us its sort of maximum tilt, so we can have the best view of the kind of underside of the rings here. So we can get a really nice, clear picture uh, of the rings sort of at there, showing us their best face, as it were, uh, from Hubble. So I just really like this picture again, mostly because it's pretty and it's Saturn. Uh, but also it's something that you can take from the ground because it's in the UV, uh, and that is something that we just we can't do UV imaging, ultraviolet imaging, of stuff from the ground. So Hubble really enabled this whole new window to be used. And this is just one such picture of something in the UV that Hubble has allowed us to do over time. Uh, next up is another awesome planet picture. Uh, and this one's a bit of a cheat. So this is Jupiter. Uh, and then you can see there in front is the moon Io uh, of Jupiter and it's casting a shadow onto Jupiter. And I just think that's A, very pretty, but B, Io is one of my favorite moons. And not so much because of this picture taken by Hubble, but because of a little movie that was taken of this moon by a different space telescope, New Horizons. So New Horizons was a telescope that we sent out to visit Pluto, um, uh, that arrived at Pluto in 2015. But to get there, it had to go past Jupiter, um, and it went past its moon Io as well. And the cool thing about Io is it has a water volcano on its surface that's erupting into space, uh, and the New Horizons camera captured that. So this is a video of a space volcano that's thrusting water 205 miles into space above the surface of the moon Io around Jupiter, and then that water's raining back down onto the surface of Io. And in my opinion, this is the coolest thing that anyone in the world has ever seen, so I hope you have enjoyed that. Um, but technically, yeah, that's not a Hubble image, but, you know, still, whatever, it's cool. It's my birthday, and I'll show you what I want to. Okay, so the next image is the Horsehead Nebula, but taken again in a wavelength that's not typically accessible from the ground, or it's hard to do from the ground, and that's the infrared. So the Horsehead Nebula is found in Orion, and again it's more of a, another sort of a, a dark nebula, uh, about 1,375 light years away from us. Uh, and this image is cool because you can compare it to what it looks like in the optical. So here we can sort of see it's like kind of a sort of ghostly dusty material, but we can see sort of lights shining through different stars through that sort of ghostly material there. But if you compare what this looks like as taken from the ground on the right here, when you look in the optical wavelengths, uh, essentially it's completely black uh, and dark uh, and opaque, so light can't shine through it. So the infrared gives us this whole new view of this nebula that we've known for a very long time. It's a very famous nebula because it looks like a horse head, and that's cool. Um, but in the infrared, we can learn so much more about what's going on in this very famous region in one of my favourite constellations. Uh, so yeah, that's very famous too. Uh, another one I quite like, and it's actually one of the desktop images on my computer. I have many, because why would you only have one space image as your desktop image? Uh, and this is the Bubble Nebula. And the Bubble Nebula is a balloon-like ball of gas that's essentially being blown into space by a super hot, massive star. So the radiation from the star in the centre is so hot that it's sort of blowing this bubble of gas around it. And that star, we think, is about 45 times the mass of our sun, so it's a really big, hot uh, star. Uh, and this is also a special picture because it's actually Hubble's 26th birthday picture. So, you know, it was a present from Hubble to itself, I guess, four years ago. And then the final one I was going to show is just a galaxy because I feel like we haven't had enough of those. And this is one of my favourite galaxy images. It's the Sombrero Galaxy, so-called because it looks a bit like a sombrero hat. Uh, and this galaxy is about 28 million light years away from us. Uh, and I like it because it's kind of almost edge on. So we're seeing sort of the edge of the disk there. And I think you, for me, it just it really shows what the sort of the shape of a disk galaxy looks like from the side. So you can see kind of all these ripples of that gas and dust in the outer, part, outer parts of the, the disk there. And so you can sort of see more what a galaxy looks like from the side in quite in quite like a large amount of detail. And for me, that's just a really stunning image. 
But okay, that's my whirlwind tour of some of my favorite images from the Hubble Space Telescope. And there's a compilation of them here. Now I was gonna put these names onto the poll, so you, or the pictures onto the poll, so you could see them as you were voting. But it turns out that Silo doesn't do that, which is sad, and I think it's a feature they should add. Um, so you're gonna have to take a look now at these images. So we have the Horsehead Nebula, the Bubble Nebula, Jupiter and Io, the Eagle Nebula, Saturn, Andromeda, the Ultra Deep Field, and the Sombrero Galaxy. Uh, I want you to decide which of those is your favorite, and I'm gonna give you just a few more seconds to decide, and then I'm gonna throw up the poll for you to auto vote. Uh, so this is your chance to decide what is the best image that Hubble has ever taken based on this biased presentation of Hubble images to you. Okay, so I'm gonna start the poll in five, four, three, two, one. So please vote. Also, the sombrero is quite popular. Horse head, bubble. I mean, like the nebulas are really pretty. You guys are less into the ultra deep field. The high reg community would be very upset about that. Like they love that thing. It is cool in their defense. Uh, Saturn and Jupiter, he does not. I guess you've seen a lot of pictures of planets before. I guess maybe that's less impressive. All right, so I'll just give you maybe another minute or so. All right, cool. So I guess the uh, the winner there is the Sombrero Galaxy, which I was a bit surprised by. I think I assumed a nebula would win because they're all like multicolored and stuff. But I'm quite pleased that a galaxy's won, uh, especially the Sombrero Galaxy. I think it's really pretty. But in general, I love all these images. So uh, yeah, pretty good going. Okay, so that's basically the end of my talk now. So I can, guess we can move on to the audience Q and A. Um, and so I've now been going through those uh, questions and I've released them all, so you can also vote on them if you want to. Uh, and I'll now start answering for you. All right, so the first one is a happy birthday wish. Um, so if the earth was flat and Hubble was on my roof at home, would I be able to clearly see people in Disney or Florida? Uh, yeah, probably, 4,500 miles is nothing to Hubble. Um, you could probably do it with one of the, um, the space, the spy telescopes. So Hubble actually is very similar in size and design um, to the spy satellites of the time. Um, so it's very well designed for spying on people, actually. And in fact, one of our proposed future missions, WFIRST, uh, is going to be built uh, using an old spy telescope that was never launched, a uh, spy satellite that was never launched. We're just going to change the direction in which it's looking at the sky. And so, yeah, they're very good for spying on people, but I think you can probably do better things with it than look at Disney World. <laughs> Dennis, I love the way the Earth rotates. It really makes my day. I knew Dennis was going to be a troublesome one. So cheeky. Uh, happy birthday. Thank you, Bill and Monica. Um, since we can reach Hubble, can't they just change the software harbour and the camera to the newest technology? So, yes, and that's what they've been doing over the years when they still had the shuttle program. Uh, so, in total, Hubble had five servicing missions. So, that first one to fix the mirror. Um, and then the subsequent four was to install a number of uh, new instruments uh, to fix, uh, change like the solar cells as well to keep it working in a good order um, and yeah, and, and things like that. So that was fine once we had a shuttle program, but at the moment uh, there is no more shuttle program. Um, so we can no longer, uh, there's no one, there's nothing to fly there to take people there to go fix it. So people have discussed in the past having robotic fixing missions, but uh, nothing has worked out from that. So until we have, um, you know, um, space transport that can take people again up to fix Hubble, uh, it's not an option. Now there are various crewed um, rockets that are being designed. So it's pretend there is talk of private companies maybe taking over and fixing Hubble in the future, but at the moment it's just not possible. But hopefully one day it will be. Um, so why wasn't the mirror defect noticed when you're still on the ground? Um, yeah, that's a good question as well. And um, it's not, so basically the company that was milling the 
the mirror, from what I understand. Uh, they were, had to do it to a certain precision and shape, uh, and there was some mistake made, uh, and they designed their own equipment as well to test that it was the right shape. And somewhere along the lines of communication, either that their measurement of the precision was incorrect, uh, or they misinterpreted something in the instructions. Um, so it got milled the wrong way, but it was very precisely milled. Like it was beautifully, perfectly made to the wrong shape. So a really high quality work <laughs> went into making it the wrong shape. And there is sort of an urban legend that, I don't even know if I should say this, but the urban legend is that they may have realized that the mirror was not uh, the correct shape shortly before launch. But by this point, the program had been delayed and delayed and delayed. And if they delayed it again, it wasn't clear they'd get another launch date. So that is the urban legend that they launched it anyway and just planned to fix it with the first service English one. But that is not at all uh, something that has been, I, I think, uh, officially stated. So who knows how much truth there is in that. Um, but certainly, yeah, maybe. Uh -huh. uh, but I think it's just, you know, um, it's hard. You assume everything's being done to the correct specifications and if there's a miscommunication or an imprecise, it's the first time they were making these kind of mirrors as well, right? So uh, they, were, they were designing it based on nothing that had been made before. And there was actually two companies designing a mirror. So Kodak made a backup mirror for the Hubble Space Telescope. So if they had known in enough time, they could have switched out the, the mirror that was incorrect for the Kodak one. But that just wasn't possible because if they did notice, which seemingly they didn't, um, it, you know, there wasn't enough time to make that change. Uh, did they use machine learning to improve the images from Hubble? And do you use any machine learning in your day-to-day -day work? Yes, Monica, they do use machine learning to improve, well, to analyze images from Hubble. Um, they use lots of different imaging techniques to improve the clarity of the images. Um, and even the ones actually that were taken when Hubble had the poorly focused light, you could do a lot to post-process them because you knew what the light was doing, so where the interference and those diffraction patterns were coming from. So we can do a lot um, to, to do improve that. And then when we're actually trying to analyze the images, so search for distant galaxies, um, just like discern what's the difference between a galaxy and a star, because at some point they can start to look quite similar. There are a number of people that use machine learning techniques uh, in order to understand what's going on in the images themselves. Uh, oh, just gonna go through a few more questions. Right. Um, how does Hubble maintain its focus on a regional object in space when it's still orbiting the, uh, orbiting the Earth and traveling quickly? All right, so this is actually a good question, Chia. Uh, and one of the things that's kind of cool about Hubble is that its position and its orbit and trajectory are not precisely known. So they, you know, with a large predictability. Um, so typically what happens is from the ground, uh, they design a bunch of programs that we can sort of use Hubble to look at. And then they're scheduled in sort of rough bands of time where they think Hubble will be in the right um, position um, to, to image those objects. And so then we will sort of assign slots where it can observe the thing you want it to from that position above the Earth. Uh, so essentially it takes a lot of planning uh, and then it's all controlled and powered from Baltimore at the Space Telescope Science Institute. Uh, and so they put a lot of work into scheduling that so that at a given time or a given position above the Earth, Hubble will be able to point at some object for about an hour at a time. So Hubble, typical, we, we schedule things in terms of Hubble orbits, which last for about an hour. Um, so you can know sort of blocks of one hour at a time whether or not I'll be able to see the kind of thing that you want it to look at. Um, Nichelle Colvin, to what distance could you use Hubble to observe the main sequence turn off? That's a really good question, Casey. Um, and so the main sequence turn off is really useful. So it's the essentially when you have stars in galaxies or star clusters, uh, when they're in the main part of their life, so they're happily burning hydrogen and turning it into helium, they live in what we call the main sequence. And uh, as they end their life on the main sequence and they start sort of burning helium instead, uh, they move off the main sequence and they sort of curve around onto a red giant branch uh, where they sort of blow up in size and become very red. And in um, a graph, you can see this as a, a sort of turning point in, in the positions of stars within a galaxy. And if you can measure where that turning point happens, you can work out how far away the galaxy is and also how old the galaxy is or the star cluster. Uh, so it's a really useful um, way of figuring out how far away something is or figuring out how old something is. Uh, and in terms of what distance we can do that to, it's probably one, like slightly beyond maybe one megaparsec or so. So galaxies within the immediate local group is possible for. Thanks, Nichelle. Uh, Bill and Monica, uh, what is the future of space telescopes? 
So it's pretty bright, actually. The next telescope that's supposed to launch is the James Webb Space Telescope. Uh, and it's the successor to Hubble, uh, although it's not quite the same as Hubble. It's, it's mo more looking in the infrared, so it's a bit different. And it's a larger mirror as well. I think it's an eight meter mirror for the James Webb Space Telescope. Um, and it has, just like Hubble, been delayed a number of times and also gone slightly over the budget uh, that it was planned to have. So I think the present cost of James Webb is something like $10 billion, and it was supposed to be more like a few billion dollars. So uh, yeah, significantly more than planned. Um, and just because, again, they're designing an incredibly complicated mission, uh, the likes of which hasn't been designed before, it's a number of technical issues. So it hasn't launched yet. Um, I think the launch date is supposed to be in the next year-ish, um, but it keeps getting pushed uh, and it, it may be slightly later still. So that telescope will really push even further back in terms of trying to study the early universe. Uh, and so it will do some really, really exciting science once it's up and launched. So we're, the community is really excited about that. Uh, and then after that, we have things as well, um, like um, the W first mission as well, which is another sort of Hubble successor. Um, and plans as well into sort of the next few decades to launch a, like a, a much larger version of the Hubble Space Telescope, essentially. And one of its key goals will be to look for habitable worlds, worlds beyond the, the solar system and sort of search for life. Um, so from Chia, what is the next space telescope going to do or discover that hasn't been done with Hubble? Uh, yeah, so I guess that's sort of similar to what I was just saying now, actually. Um, so yeah, so James Webb will be able to peer much further back into the early portion of the universe. Uh, and so really answer a lot of our questions about how um, at the early star formation, so the first stars in the universe, how and when did they form, uh, the very first galaxies, uh, and that kind of thing. So it's really going to be able to sort of peer into cosmic dawn, as it were. Uh, and so that's one of the big key things that, that James Webb will do. Um, thank you, Alfred, uh, for the happy birthday wishes. Um, what's the densest object in the universe? Um, <laughs> uh, so probably black holes. Black holes are the densest objects in the universe, so dense that light cannot escape from them. So they are denser than the Prime Minister, um, surprisingly. Um, can the SpaceX mission be used to update Hubble? Uh, no, they haven't designed anything yet that has the capability of servicing Hubble. So they can take people to and from the International Space Station, but it's quite different to go up into orbit and spend several days at a time uh, with multiple spacewalks out to uh, something like the Hubble Space Telescope. Um, uh, so they have nothing so far that could, could do that kind of role, but they're certainly probably one of the companies that would be, if they could develop something, would be interested in trying to help out with that, maybe. Uh, this is a great talk, how are you so awesome? Thanks for that. Uh, it's good to hear things like that on my birthday. I'm just great. Um, from Sappy, happy birthday, am I drinking wine? Yes, I am drinking wine, actually. Just one glass, um, because, you know, I'm professional. Um, would it be possible to upgrade the mirror? So... That was one thing they discussed at the time because they had this backup mirror from Kodak. You know, potentially they could just fly the mirror up and replace it, but actually that's a huge logistical problem uh, and it's actually a very expensive mission to do uh, and more dangerous. It would involve taking apart a lot more of the telescope um, and, you know, there's a lot of drama in general with um, space missions. It's quite, often quite slow-paced. So one of my favourite things about watching the 2009 service mission was when one of the astronauts was unscrewing something uh, and he dropped the screw. And in space, if you drop something, it just keeps moving. Uh, and you're attached to a telescope. So if it moves the wrong way, essentially that screw is gone forever. And then potentially you can't close the telescope again because you don't have another screw. Um, so this screw was very slowly dropping. And I remember the whole, like, the crowd watching and just being like, oh, holding their breath. Like a bunch of astronomers get really excited about screws dropping. Uh, and then eventually the astronaut just put his hand underneath it and, and caught the screw. So it was perfectly fine. Uh, but it was like a really... <laughs> a really tense uh, few few seconds there. So yeah, the mirror is, is, is would be a huge work and probably a bit too dangerous to do. Um, with the commercial crew launching from American soil again, can we see Hubble getting further maintenance missions in order to operate longer? It is possible. Um, I think we don't know is the, is the answer to that, whether or not it will be possible. It sort of depends on uh, what the next, the next um, crewed missions are. When they launch as well, if Hubble breaks down in the meantime, um, so, you know, if any of the major instruments go, then Hubble will just be a dead stick. So uh, if it can continue on for another decade or so, then that, that is certainly possible. Um, how does Hubble create flats and darks for CCD imaging, image profiling? Um, I assume it does internal, um, internal flats uh, somehow. I don't actually know. That's a very good question. I don't know how it flat fields itself. <laughs> 
Um, so I can't answer that question, I'm afraid, Nathaniel. Uh, it's too hard for me. Um, happy birthday. Has the Hubble telescope managed to detect the presence of water on exoplanets? Um, so they have, uh, I can't remember if it's Hubble, it may be, um, but they have, uh, yeah, certainly some, some telescopes have found the evidence for water in the atmospheres of different exoplanets uh, far away from the Earth. So I think that has been done. Uh, I'm just not sure if it's with Hubble or not. Uh, thank you for the birthday wishes. Uh, I also don't know, I'm afraid, Nathaniel, how Hubble maintains a CCD at low temperatures. I'm not, I'm not up on the, the technical specs there. Uh, and then more megapixels. So certainly uh, the camera has been updated to have um, something with a higher number of megapixels now as well. So the new cameras that they have there have many, many more megapixels than that first one. Um, good. Um, so that's it. That's all the questions, I think. Uh, thank you very much for attending. Uh, it's been really fun. I've really enjoyed my birthday talk. I hope you have too. Uh, and I guess I'll probably end it there. Thanks, everyone.